Welcome to Forward Life Church online service. We are glad that you decided to join us today. We hope that you have been enjoying our services. If you missed any of our previous services, you can go to our Facebook page or our YouTube channel to watch. I will leave you with Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Thanks again for joining us. Good morning, family. How's everybody doing this week? I'm excited to have you back. Listen, it's Palm Sunday, and I know it's unusual for a church not to gather on Palm Sunday. And this just hasn't been a, a very usual year. It's been a very unusual year. And so it's been over a year since we've been in a pandemic. It's been over a year since we gathered as a church family. And we were thinking, what if we went back and looked at the service the very last time that we gathered as a church family? Listen, we started a series at that point. It was called Jesus Plus, built on the backs of what... Disney Plus has done, and I talked about that that day, but we didn't get a chance to finish that particular series, and maybe the Lord will lead us to do it again once we start gathering again. I want to assure you that we are working diligently at trying to gather again. We've been working the past few weeks, even though I've been off from preaching, I haven't been off from working behind the scenes on church matters. So we're working on trying to get us back to gathering again. And we're going to come up with a hybrid model of online ministry and in-person ministry. But in the meantime, I want to take you back to the last service that we had together live in person over a year ago where I preached a message called that was only a suggestion. Listen, I'll see you once the message is over and we'll talk further then. The Bible. And so uh, I have the task of returning the favor and I'm going to do so. I'm going to take these Disney storylines and relate them to Jesus. Is that cool with y'all? Come, Come on. Wrote a song about it. Like to hear? Here it goes. <laughs> In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, the English Standard Version, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, I'm reading the English Standard Version, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I want to take my thought from verse 3 where it says, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become red. I want you to look at somebody next to you who seems like they're at least interested in what the preacher got to say today and say, That was only a suggestion. That was only a suggestion. 
That was only a suggestion is what I want to speak from. Father God, I thank you today uh, for this opportunity. I thank you for your word. I thank you for this chance to share in your word. And Lord, I pray with all uh, sincerity that whatever comes out of my mouth today will glorify, will edify, will uplift, will raise, will pour, will encourage, will pull people into another dimension of faith and understanding of you in Jesus name and everybody said amen. 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 amen this scene in Matthew's gospel reminds me of another famous scene in one of my favorite Disney movies the little mermaid this classic animated film has deep spiritual meaning for those who look below the surface, no pun intended. <laughs> For starters, we have Ariel, a mermaid who is the daughter of a king. However, she doesn't quite understand the position she's in. She seems to be unappreciative of her father's way of life. She ignores his wisdom and is constantly preoccupied by things that she shouldn't do. Uh, matter of fact, uh, she's so enamored by human life that when we see the scene begins to open, that she's always out of place and out of position. Uh, she liked to do things like going to the surface, collecting human artifacts, and interfering with human life. She, she has a deep obsession about her that lures her into a world that she knows nothing about. Uh, Ariel reminds me of us. Sometimes we don't always understand Understand the significance of being a child of God. And at times we too would rather ignore his wisdom and go our own way to collect things that we're fascinated with. And at times we find ourselves pulled into places where we shouldn't be. Have you ever found yourself in a place where you just shouldn't be? You know that that's not the place place that you're supposed to be in and you know what your daddy said however in spite of what your daddy says you find yourself doing things that you just shouldn't do and, and, and then there are Ariel's two sidekicks Sebastian and Flounder and I, I really want you to pay attention to her two sidekicks because we can learn something from them Sebastian is a hard shell crab and Flounder is a colorful fish but because Sebastian was sent on assignment by Ariel's dad as her chaperone he represents the God consciousness for her and Flounder on the other hand represents her free will here it is if you notice there's a constant battle within Ariel between Sebastian her consciousness and flounder her free will. Flounder never gives much resistance to anything that Ariel wants to do. He, he helped her to collect and hide human artifacts and even traveled with her frequently to the service. He's bright, he's colorful, and he's easygoing, whereas Sebastian is hard, crusty, and abrasive. I said that just to say this, that easygoing and pleasant to be with isn't always the best options for a friend. Sometimes you need someone in your life that's a little bit hard and a little bit crusty and a Sebastian. Right? God, you need somebody in your life who can hold you accountable. Somebody who loves you enough to be hard on you when it's necessary. You need someone in your life who can rub you the wrong way to get the right response and the right results. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
saying. I'm going to say that again. You need somebody in your life who rubs you the wrong way so that you can get the right results. Too many free-spirited people can lead you to a world of bondage. Ah, oh my God. I need somebody who reminds me of what it is that my father has to say. Uh, don't just go alone to get alone. Uh, don't just do this or uh, don't just uh, somebody who just reminds me that I can't do this or, or I can't do that. I shouldn't do this or I shouldn't do that. I need somebody in my life every now and then that reminds me of what it is that my father's agenda is as opposed to what I want to do. I don't need whatever feels good do it folk in my life. I'm a little too reckless for people like that. Rock if I got too many We'll do whatever it feel good people in my life I'm going to be back on Winsboro Road somewhere at Soda, Six and Suds uh, y'all don't know nothing about Six, Sodas and Suds that's a Monroe, Louisiana thing uh, we used to go and hang out at Six, Sodas and Suds you could read between the line of what that might be and what we might be doing I, I might end up somewhere at the club if, if I got somebody in my life no I got to get up and preach the next day but here I am in the club Here I am at the liquor store Here I am doing this or doing that Because I got too many loosey goosey Do whatever you want to do Do whatever feel good people in my life I'm a little too reckless I don't know about y'all Y'all look like y'all got it all together And you were born on a pew Oh my God, it look like you were baptized in the womb But I got some problems David said that we were born in sin And Sheep in iniquity, and every now and then I get a little too reckless. Oh my God. I don't need too many feel good people in my life because feel good in some moments isn't necessarily good in the long haul. Come on, yeah. Then there is King Triton and Ursula who can't stand each other. And I, I like a good antagonist, protagonist fight in a story. I like when two people in a story just be honest and say, I don't like you. Uh, sometimes we just got too many fake people in our lives and, and we don't want to confront and be honest and say, man, I really don't like you like you think I like you. Let's try to figure this thing out. And work this thing through because I want to like you, but you just get on my nerve every now and then. And I know there's some things about me that gets on your nerves too. So let's just have a seat at the table and discuss our differences so that we can just get along and make this situation work. But we got King Triton and Ursula and they can't stand each other. One is good and the other is evil. And after finding Ariel's secret cold filled with things, that he forbade her from doing and having, Triton dealt with Ariel harshly. Mm -hmm. Triton destroyed her secret life and is in a, her moment of displeasure with her father that the enemy tempts her. Mm. Right. <laughs> Ariel handled herself well. She knew who Ursula was. Mm. She had already known that her father uh, told her to stay away from the sea witch. But it was five words that got her attention that she just couldn't resist. That was only a suggestion. It's in this area where I want to spend some time because suggestive thought is a major problem. It, 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 it's been linked with self-hypnosis. Why? Because if I can convince you of something and convince that it's your idea and you act on it, then if it blows up on you, the onus of taking the responsibility for what happened is not on me, it's on you. And, and if I suggest to you to do something and the consequences come back in a way that you don't want them to come back on you, then I can easily wash my hands of the whole deal and say, I didn't tell you to do that. I only suggested it to you. And I'm here to tell you that 
what we have to understand is that when a person, when you're able to convince somebody of something and make them think that it's of their own will and that they're acting out on it on their own and that you only suggested it, then unconsciously you can change their behavior and when they don't get the response they want, they won't blame you, they'll blame themselves. Come on now. Come on. The thing about suggestive thought is it's neither good nor bad. I'm going to help somebody today. It, it's, it's efficacy really comes down to the intent behind it. And, and for example, if someone were to suggest to me that I can lose weight or make more money, then that's not really a bad thing. However, if their suggestion says that I got to harm myself to lose the weight or I got to do something scandalous to get the money, that's where the delineate, delineation lies. And, and and it's in this delineation that the subtleties of suggestive thought are tricky. It can be hard to delineate what you're hearing when you're preoccupied. Come on, yeah. Yeah, right. Come on. Right. When you're preoccupied by what you're experiencing, it can be hard to delineate between what you're hearing, the good or the bad, and what you're hearing. When you look at the encounters, both of Jesus and Ariel, both were preoccupied. Mm. Right, man. Come on. Ariel was preoccupied by the emptiness she was left to face after her disobedience to her father was made known and all the stuff she did in defiance towards her dad was brought to an abatement. Mm, right. Which means, watch this, dalliance with disobedience leaves one destitute. Mm, all right. All right. Bring that back. Dalliance with disobedience leaves one destitute. All the work she put into not honoring her father's wishes left her empty. Oh my God, when we look at the scene, she's in an empty cove. And if you go back and look at the movie, that cove was filled with all kinds of stuff from the world that she really wanted to be in. Yet her daddy came in and saw all the things that she was flirting with, the life that she wanted to have and the lifestyle that she wanted to live. And he came in and just started zapping and breaking up stuff. Oh my God, Triton is a daddy like me. Oh, what you got up in this bed? What you hiding under this mattress? What you doing up in this room? Triton went up in there just start snatching stuff out of closets and turning over mattresses and looking under the bed. Oh, just went crazy and lost his mind when he saw what his daughter was doing in private. I like them kind of daddies because them that kind of daddies ain't gonna let you slip. Them kind of daddies ain't gonna let you get caught up on something, them kind of daddies going to turn over tables and act a fool just to make sure that what you're doing is on point training. is like me. I'm trained. Ah. You got up in here. You hiding up in here. <laughs> oh, man, I need help. <laughs> Jesus, on the other hand, is preoccupied with emptiness himself but it's a different kind of emptiness. Verse 2 in the text says, And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. He's preoccupied by the need for nourishment. Jesus is like, man, I just got off of Winsboro Road. Is the kettle open? <laughs> Go to the kettle, man. I'm going to Shoney's or somewhere. Anybody got a fries and a burger or something? I'm just hungry. And, and it's the different type of preoccupation from Ariel's because she's preoccupied. Watch this. Ariel is preoccupied by self-wants. Jesus is preoccupied by self-denial. Okay, okay, let me run that back, let me run that back, let me run that back. Ariel is preoccupied by self-wants. Jesus is preoccupied by self-denial. And people who practice self-denial are disciplined and not desperate. 
Oh, come on. Look at somebody and tell them, baby, I'm disciplined. I ain't desperate. I, I'm disciplined. I, I don't I know what I want. I know what I should have, but I ain't desperate. And, and they have wants like everybody else, but they're not at the expense of what they stand to lose in their discipline. Have you ever just been working out real good and getting good results and, and your stomach is getting flatter and you're trying to firm up and, and, and firming up a little bit and you go out with some friends and you have your little kale salad and you eat your little salmon and all of a sudden the man comes by with a dessert menu and says uh, do you want some dessert and you have to fight like oh get out just to say no I don't want that I'm disciplined but I'm not desperate and sometimes that's how you got to be in your walk with God you've been doing everything on, you're supposed to do you've been standing up the way you're supposed to stand up you've been praying like you should you've been believing like you should you've been fasting like you should and when the enemy comes by to tip you with that deception and you gotta look at it and say baby I'm disciplined but not desperate it looks good it'll satisfy my appetite it'll make me satisfied for a moment but after I get through eating it, I feel guilty. And some of y'all need to go on a diet in the spirit. You need to go on a diet in your prayer life. You need to go on a diet in your behavior. You need to go on a diet in certain things in your life so that when you get to the moment of, of being tripped up and getting in a moment where they're trying to tempt you, you will say, I'm disciplined, not desperate. Discipline, not desperate. Yes, Lord, man. Jesus is like, bruh, I want what I want, but I'm not about to shortcut all I sacrificed to get it. Right, 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 right. That's right. Watch this. Jesus had a vacancy, not a void. Mm, thank you, Lord. Here it is. A vacancy means. The space is empty, but I'm selective about who I allow to fill it. All right, all right, all right. Avoid means the space is empty and I'm desperate and will fill it by any means necessary. And you got to be careful. Oh my God, not to have a void in your life. Oh, I may have a vacancy, but I ain't gonna have a void. A void has to be filled right now. A vacancy, I can take my time and look through applicants and make sure that I get the right person or the right thing in my life. I ain't got to be in a hurry in this season. I ain't got to be in a rush in this moment. I can take my time and cross my T and dot every I to make sure I get the right thing in my life. I ain't interested in messing myself up, tripping because I got a void and I got to do something about it right now. I ain't interested in messing myself up, tripping because I got something that needs to be happening right now. I'm going to take my time and go through what I got to go through in order to get the right thing in the place that it needs to be in. Come on, baby. Come on. And so when you understand that, the truth is... There are only two things the devil can use against you. And I don't know if I put this on the screen, but it's provocation and accusation. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Somebody say provocation, provocation. and accusation. accusation. He can't truly make you do anything, but if he can provoke you, he can accuse you. If he can provoke you, he can accuse you. He's an accusation specialist who burns both ends of the candles. He'll suggest that you do something only to accuse you with the intent to shame you. He'll provoke you on one end and then blame you on the other. And I don't care how good he makes it sound or how great it makes you feel. If an accusation is attached to it, be careful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I have two problems in this text, and hopefully y'all can help me work out my problems because I believe in allowing the people to help you work through your problems while you're preaching because that helps you understand where, where we're going. Maybe you can get some help too. I have two problems in this text. Oh my God, it's bothering me. The text says, verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. Mm -hmm. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Mm -hmm. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Mm -hmm. Now I got two problems in the text. Mm -hmm. And the first problem I see in the text, I'm actually going to deal with second and I'm going to deal with the second problem first because the Bible says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. <laughs> Thank you for that scripture to help me go through this problem I have. The first thing I want you to hone in on is the timing of Satan's attack. The timing of his attack because the timing of his attack will determine the weaponry he will use against you. Right. Oh, this is going to help somebody. This is going to help somebody. The timing of his attack will determine the weaponry he will use against you. Here it is. Just based off of hood ethics, Torrent. I know you know something about this. Just based off the of hood ethics, if I'm going to jump somebody, I'm going to jump them at the time that I believe I have the best advantage. That's right. That's right. Just based off of hood ethics. <laughs> and can I tell you that Satan is a hood rat? Yeah. <laughs> He's a hood rat because he, the values of a hood rat is not the same values as a child of God. So when Satan approached Jesus, he approached him because he didn't place much value on the condition that Jesus was in. Oh my God, he thought that approaching him after he fasted would be the time that he would be able to tempt him. Right, right. However, what he didn't understand is fasting didn't make Jesus weaker. It made Jesus stronger. Amen. So by the time Satan had developed a weapon that was he thought was strong enough to take Jesus down, Jesus was resolved that he was going to obey his father uh, because he had already been tested and proven for 40 days and 40 nights. And can I tell you that if you do something long enough that you're going to already have a resolve that I'm going to continue in this. I'm going to continue to be disciplined. I'm going to continue to be faithful. I'm going to continue to remain on my assignment. Why? Because I've been doing it for 40 days and 40 nights. And ain't no sense in me being tripped up now just because you come over here trying to make me make some Mrs. Bird's bread. I don't work for Mrs. Bird's. Oh my God. I work for the kingdom. Oh my Before I prayed, you should have got 
me before I passed him. He should have got me before I called on his name. But now that I know his name, now that I have prayed, now that I have fasted, now that I've been with him, you can have your little old tricks. You can have your little old traps. And you can have your little old snares. I am determined. You should have got me when I was in the club. You should have got me when I was on crack. You should have got me when I was sleeping with any and everybody. You should have got me when I was drunk out of my mind. But now that my mind's made up, I'm on my way up. I'm going to hold my head up to be with the Lord. I'm sorry. Come on, man. My mind is made up. I'm on my way up. I'm going to hold my But sin is so stupid. By the time he comes up with something clever enough to trap you, you're already several steps ahead of him. But here's the caveat with that. The flip side, however, is if the enemy is able to effectively use something against you, it's probably in an area that you haven't submitted to the obedience of the Father. Uh -huh. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. Mm -hmm. Jesus was so committed to his assignment that the Bible says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even the death of the cross. That's in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, the English Standard Version. Now, we're not expected to die the death that has already been death taken care of by Jesus. However, there are awesome things that we need to die to. Oh, Jesus, help me up in here. <laughs> There are some things that we need to die to. And I'm afraid that we have to really search these things out so that we can be obedient to the Father. There are certain things that keep us tethered to the tricks of the enemy. In, in a John, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 16 in NIV, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Here it is when the text mentions the world is speaking of a system or a collection of things designed to draw us in. And, and the world as a system or collection of attitudes, ideas, and desires is alienated from the Father. Therefore, it wants to alienate us as well. Uh, desires of the flesh is unlawful self-gratification. Desires of the eyes is sinful delights of our mind or emotions and the pride of life is vain security and fleeting the things and the father wants us to enjoy life and he doesn't have a problem with us having things but what he wants us to do is he never wants the things to become uh, come between us and him he doesn't want anything to alienate us from him and this is where Ursula was able to to trap Ariel. She was so bent on what she wanted that she couldn't see the bait and switch. Mm, right, yeah. right, right. Mm -hmm. You want to know what the enemy is truly after in your life? Your voice. Yeah. Yeah. Because if he can get your voice, mm. He can disempower you and manipulate everything and everybody around Come you. Uh, Ariel gave Ursula her voice. And when she gave Ursula her voice, she was powerless in the place she longed to be. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you something and still be your friend? 
here's a question for you. What good is going where you want if you can't bring your whole self when you get there? The thing that made Ariel powerful and the thing that made Ariel most effective was taken from her. So by the time she got to where she wanted to be, she couldn't do anything that she wanted to do. And that's how the enemy will set you up. He'll give you the thing that you want in exchange for the thing you really need. Come on. Bring it back. Bring it back. That was a good time to give me a hit on that, ma'am. Bye, He'll give you the thing you want in exchange for the thing you really need. Because by the time Ariel got to the real world that she desired to be in, Eric didn't even recognize who she was. Why? Because he could only recognize her according to her voice. She could have to nod and she could wiggle her toes and she could wiggle her hands and she had this whole new world that she could embrace but she was ineffective in that world. Why? Because she exchanged her position in that world for what she truly possessed and the thing that really distinguished her from everybody else was her voice. She literally received a gag gift. And I wonder, you good, and I wonder how many of us have found ourselves in places where we got what we wanted only to realize that what we had to compromise in the process was critical to our effectiveness in the place we desired to be. Mm-hmm. Some of us got the job, but you can't say nothing to your boss about the nefarious things he does because you'll get fired. <laughs> Some of us got in the room But we can't share our ideas because the person who put us in the room would think that our sharing of our ideas is to undermine them because we're gunning for their position. Some of us got promoted, but the promotion is contingent upon being a team player, which usually means do what I say or else. You got in the position, you got the opportunity, you got in your foot in the door, but when you got there, everything that makes you who you really are was not useful because you had to exchange that for being in the place that you desired to be in. And I'm here to tell you that in this season, don't you compromise what makes you unique, don't you compromise what makes you special, don't you compromise what sets you apart because the moment that you compromise what sets you apart you will miss your opportunity because you will be in a place without the resources you need to be effective and this ladies and gentlemen is what the enemy is truly after he's truly after the thing that empowers you Mm, thank you Lord and this brings me to my second point. Let me get out of here because I'm boring y'all to death. Come on. <laughs> the second thing I want you to hone in on, we've established that the timing of Satan's attack will determine his weapon against you. We've established also that our obedience to the Father determines uh, the density of our resistance to the attack, have we not? Right. But you want to know the second problem I see in the text? The text says in verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, I'm going to say it again. Come on. Come on. Y'all here. Y'all don't see it. Y'all don't see it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, okay, okay. Bring it back. Bring it back. We gotta get these people to see it. Lord, help me to open their eyes. Take the scale off these people's eyes, Lord. The text says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Wait a minute. I'm a bit befuddled here. Might be a little dyslectic. Am I reading this correctly? The Spirit led Jesus to be tempted? I'm tripping. I'm befuddled. I'm stumped. I'm at a loss for words, but I got to preach, so I got to get my words back. <laughs> Why would the Spirit yeah. lead Jesus into temptation? Before we answer this question, I want to indulge your thinking and help you to understand the uniqueness of this situation. By all accounts, this is the first time Satan, in his purest form, has approached someone. First time throughout the Bible, Satan in his purest self has approached someone. In Genesis, we see him as a serpent. In Job, we see him as a permitted disaster. In Isaiah, we see him as a fallen star. In Ezekiel, we see him as a fallen angel. And in Zechariah, we see him in a vision as an accuser. But here in our text today, he's hiding not behind a metaphor. He's in plain sight. He's not hiding behind what we think we know about him. He's emboldened about what he knows about himself. And isn't it interesting that the enemy wants you to be fearful and wants you to back down on who you are while he stands up boldly and proudly in what he knows about himself. Here it is. I want you to understand that this is why the Spirit led Jesus into temptation. By the Spirit leading Jesus, he's making a statement to Satan before he ever tempted Jesus. And this is why Satan's opening statement to Jesus is, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wait a minute. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Do we see in the text what Jesus said and announces I'm the son of God? So why is it that when Satan approached Jesus, his opening statement is, if you are the son of God, the reason Satan opens with this statement and showed up in this manner is because the Spirit of God already announced to Satan who Jesus was. Uh -huh. Here it is in Romans chapter 8 verse 14 it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Oh my! So the spirit showed up and made the announcement to Satan, ah, just because he was there, that must be a son of God because he's led by the spirit. And can I tell you that if you're a person who's under attack in this season, the reason why you're under attack is because you're led by his spirit. Oh, yes. And when the enemy sees that you're led by his spirit, guess what? When you're led by the spirit, you don't have to qualify the announcement of your arrival. There you go. Come on. Hallelujah. You don't have to qualify the announcement of your arrival. That's okay. Bring me back with that soft music. I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> The enemy knew who Jesus was by how he was led. Amen. Amen. If I had somebody patting with me right about now. Slide, baby, slide. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> when you're led by the Spirit, you don't have to qualify the announcement right. of your arrival. Amen. 
The Holy Spirit said he's already qualified. He's already certified and he's already bona fide. So when you get to where you're going, all you have to do is know what your father says when you get there. Come on. <laughs> what did Jesus say every time Satan approached him? He said, my daddy said, man shall not live by bread alone. My daddy said, do not test the Lord your God. My daddy said, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. When you are led by the Spirit, all you got to do is know what your daddy said when you get there. So when the enemy comes to you, he can't trip you up. You ain't got to waste your voice on him. Jesus didn't waste his voice. He just spoke what his daddy said. I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. Here it is and I'm done. Jesus was led into temptation so that we don't have to be. You remember the model prayer? What is it saying? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt. That we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Watch this. Why did he say we have the right to say lead us not into temptation? Because he had already been led there and dealt with it. But here's the revelation. Jesus said, we can say, lead us not to temptation. But it doesn't say that temptation won't be led to us. Right. Yes. Right. So when temptation is led to you, all you got to do is remind temptation of what your daddy said. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, get out of the way. Ariel didn't do this. She got herself tripped up, but guess what her daddy did? He came along and laid his life down for her. And her and her man went and fought the battle, killed the devil, Ursula. Her daddy came back, restored her to the family, and then gave her what she wanted anyway. If you obey the Father, and do things his way, he'll give you what you want in the end. Come on, man. But you just got to hold on. Come on, man. I'm glad you stuck around to go back down memory lane with us. Listen, I want to remind you, we're going to start a brand new series next week. I'm excited to start that series, and I believe that it's going to be something that's going to energize your faith and propel you going into the rest of this year. I want to remind you also that next week, because it will be Easter Sunday, it will be a communion Sunday. So have your communion elements ready. Again, I want to reiterate that we are working diligently to try to get us back to in-person service. Be in prayer with us about that because we need your prayers, but we also need your financial support. Don't forget your above and beyond offering if you've made a pledge. We definitely appreciate you for making that pledge and don't forget your regular giving. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for those who have stuck with us during this challenging time and this period. Lord, I ask you, Father, to bless them in a tremendous way. Do some marvelous things in their lives, their, their ministries, their purposes, their careers, whatever it is, Father, that they have petitioned you for in this season. I ask, Lord, that you will grant their petition, grant every request, and not only that, Lord God, but move them into a realm of favor that they've never seen before in their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you next week.